Uh, welcome to the first seminar for today. Uh, I'm Doug Becky. I'm with the World War II History Roundtable, and we do the seminars out here. And I'm also the curator of the State's Military History Museum up at uh, Camp River. And so if you haven't been up there, it's a really good museum. And, uh, please try to get up there. It's open seven days a week from 10 to 5 until October 1st, when we shift over to a Thursday, Friday schedule. It's <laughs> kind of the nature of the place. So, uh, anyway, uh, today's uh, first seminar is on bombers in World War II, Vietnam, and Cold War. So, I think we're going to get some stark contrast there between things, how things were done and how things were done more recently. Although, uh, well, Vietnam's going to be a long time ago, too, isn't it? <laughs> So we got two uh, World War II B-17 crewmen uh, here, Bob Clemens and Vince Parker, and two from B-52s, Glenn Sell and John Finish. So uh, first, I'd just like to ask, uh, I'll start with the World War II guys. I'll wait till this. Uh, can you hear me with this airplane noise? Or I'm gonna wait a minute. Should I repeat that? Okay, so we'll start with the World War II guys. So Bob Clemens, um, what made you want to be uh, uh, in the Air Force and fly in World War II? Well, when I was about six or seven, I got an airplane model, a big steel model that had a wingspan of about 16 inches and a fuselage about 18 inches long in depth. From that time on, I figured I would like to fly someday, but growing up during the Depression, I was pretty sure that we'd never, I'd never have enough money to fly. So when World War II started, uh, I was a senior in high school, and I thought, well, this is my chance. So I went into the Army Air Force at age 18, five months after I graduated from high school. And this, how about for you? Well, you know, the day that the bombs dropped on Pearl Harbor, I was out northeast of Ortonville, Minnesota, hunting jackrabbits. Never occurred to me I would ever be caught up in the war. But my dad lost his help. I had to go to work in the meat market for him day and night. I, was, I could hardly wait to get into the war. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. So I enlisted and went down to Fort Snelling, and I got in the war in February 5th, 1945, I went down fortunately and he got into the service. Okay. And uh, uh, when you uh, came in in the 60s, that, why, right. why did you want to fly? Uh, I grew up uh, in, uh, with a lot of uh, excuse me, World War II vets around me, and I found out very quickly that I liked to listen to the Air Force people the best. And my brother ended up going in the Navy, which kind of said to me I was going into the Air Force and the Navy when I graduated. Uh, college twisted my mind around. I ended up as a social worker for Ramsey County when the draft board caught up with me. And I went down, I was going to enlist in the Navy, and the Air Force intercepted me, and I went in the Air Force. And uh, looking back, I'm very glad I didn't go in the Navy because I was married at that time, and Throughout my tour, my wife was always very close to me. Now John, uh, you came in in the 80s or something? Yeah, 80s. Early 80s. And why did you want to fly? Why did you want to be in the Air Force? And actually, it was uh, pretty much what, what these guys laid out in front of me. Uh, I was also uh, building model airplanes, and I was building the B-17s, and I was building the B-52s, and uh, the F-4s. And I was coming to events like this that were going on. And where I really piqued my interest was during the 70s, uh, as Vietnam was winding down. So I was, uh, had that history and uh, the excitement about flying uh, that I got from going to air shows and air events. So I decided to go into the Air Force and uh, went the ROTC route and went to, it was then the College of St. Thomas, it's now University of St. Thomas. And, uh, that's where I got my commission and uh, got my navigator slot and then went to navigator. Okay. 
Well, there's often a, uh, a difference between what you want to do and what you're allowed to do. So, Bob, um, you're an 18-year-old uh, guy right out of high school, like most of us, you probably thought you knew a lot. Uh, getting in the Air Force to be a, a pilot, a, a navigator or something would be a, no sweat. How, what was the selection process? I imagine it was more rigorous than you might have thought. Yeah, they, they gave a test then, which rate, rated you, uh, ranked you one to nine for a pilot, navigator, bombardier, and I was fortunate enough to score nine on all three of them. And so, uh, because math was my favorite subject, I wanted to be a navigator, and uh, for, one, for one time, that doesn't happen too often. I said, that's what I would like to be, and they said, fine, you go to navigation school. So, uh, we started out with basic training because we were part of the Army at that time, and then I went to college, college training detachment at Washington University in St. Louis for four months, and then was uh, sent to pre-flight at Ellington Field in Houston, Texas, and then from Hondo, Texas, 40 miles west of San Antonio, and that's where I got my wings and my commission as a second lieutenant at age 19. And this, how about for you? How, how, how was it? Did you just sign up and get what you wanted, or was there a selection process for you? When I got to Fort Snelling, I flunked the physical. <laughs> I'd fallen out of a tree as a kid with a compound fracture this arm. I wanted to be a fighter, but the doctor said, sorry, soldier. School in Las Vegas, Nevada. Gunnery School was fun. In, in Nevada, we go to town and have Class A passes. We treated us like human beings for a change. But we only made $50 a month. One roll of the dice and it was gone. But one day, my best friend in basic training and in gunnery school, Bud Riley, came to me with a $20 bill. Parker were rich. His mother had tucked it in the folds of the letter. Just to let you know how we lived together. Spanning this way. We'd go to town and we'd ride horseback. Then he came and we, Parker, were wealthy. There were 220. She was riding every day. We went and rode horseback. We went to gambling halls. We went to girly shows. <laughs> if she had known what was going on with that money. Then we went to, uh, we assembled at Lincoln with a crew. We boarded a ship and went to Naples. We flew our combat missions in Italy. Uh, and. Uh, We'll, we'll let it go at that. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, Glenn, uh, what was the selection for you? Um, I made a decision and I wanted to be an Air Force pilot. And, uh, no, no, wait a minute, you'd been drafted. No, I hadn't been drafted yet. Oh, okay. I evaded, I evaded the draft the first time by getting married. They caught up with me. Or I knew they were catching up with me. And then I said, hey, wait a minute, this ain't so bad. I can be a pilot. I can be a fighter pilot. That's better than being a social worker. So I took the AFOQT test, six and the navigator and the pilot, and passed all of those. And so I was qualified to be a pilot or a navigator. And I was also qualified mentally to be an officer. Which, that's another question. That's the story all together. So I passed that and he said, well, you're still not there. I'm like, what? Well, you've got to fly up to Marquette, Michigan and be looked at by a flight surgeon. So I flew up there and I passed that test. And they said, no, no, you're not done yet. Uh, we, you have to pass a security clearance. And then I think back to some of the stupid things I did. I knew I wasn't on paper for anything, but maybe someone heard of some of my outrageous stunts. They didn't. So I cleared the secret clearance, and just about that time, uh, my rich uncle said, uh-uh, Mr. Sell, we want you to take a physical downtown. So I had to go down and take my uh, army physical, and uh, the surgeon, uh, the doctor was amazed because I said, I have nothing wrong with me, <laughs> which apparently he had uh, heard a lot of excuses. I wasn't, uh, uh, the, the Air Force, excuse me, the Army wasn't going to wait for me to go in the Air Force, so I went into what's called the Late Enlistment Program, and then finally the Air Force sent me down to uh, Lackland, 
where I went through basic training, uh, OTS, pilot training, and then washed out of pilot training, took a short excursion to Cape Cod, then to John, you're in ROTC, so that you're kind of on a, on a freight train running you through all these steps, right? Right, uh, to a large extent, yes. The, at the time I joined, it was an all-volunteer force, so there was no draft in effect. So I applied at ROTC, and like that, uh, I took the AFOQT, Office of Qualification Test, the pilot and MAV portions. I passed all of them. And I was qualified to, for a pilot slot. St. Thomas had a pilot slot, and they they, they put me into that. Then I had to go for the physical. Uh, with the physical, my right eye was 20/30. So they said, "No, nope, you lost the pilot slot. Do you still want to go ROTC?" Didn't even question it. It's okay. Well, I'm a little bummed out. I can't be a pilot, but I'm going to go the navigator route, and uh, that's how that's my selection process. Then uh, graduated from St. Thomas. I was commissioned. Actually, met my wife while I was at St. Thomas. Uh, 1982. This is 1982. Very busy year. Uh, May 1982. We were both commissioned second lieutenants. A week later, we were married. Uh, that December, I was sent to Mather, California for flight training. I brought my wife with me. She was there 30 days, then went to Biloxi, Mississippi uh, for communication officer training. And then, uh, as we get into it, a year and a half later, uh, we were back together at Mark's Air Force Base in Louisiana. So, now we're going to concentrate on B-17s in World War II for a little while. Uh, both Vince and Bob went to Italy in 15th Air Force. Most of the navigating by dead reckoning. 
looking down at the ground. Now, we did take training in celestial navigation in case you went to the Pacific, because they flew at night in the Pacific, but in Europe, we flew in the daytime. And uh, often you were a lead navigator. Just so, one, just one. Okay, well, talk about uh, uh, being, what were you leading? What were you leading when you were leading? We were leading uh, six groups of B-17s, so it would be uh, about uh, 150 airplanes. Okay. And we were going to Budapest. Okay, so that's 1,500 men, 150 airplanes going to Budapest, oh, 800 miles? Yeah, about, about 800 miles. About 800 miles. <laughs> and you're the guy that's in charge of getting them there, yeah. and you're 19 years old. Well, I'm 20 then. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 I'm just to be an old man. Well, that explains why they made it. Yeah. I always say I flew 50 missions six months before I legally could buy a drink. <laughs> So, uh, Bob's in the front of the plane, Vince is the tail gunner, he's in the back of the plane. So, Bob sees what's coming and Vince sees what's been. So, Vince, you want to talk about your position in the plane and, uh, and your duties and responsibilities? There was only uh, three professional gunners on the B-17. The tail gunner, one of the waist gunners, and the guy in the lower ball turret. Our only job was to scan the sky and search for the enemy and other things that might be happening. The rest of the crew were encumbered with flying or navigating, or, and the waist gunner got a half of you. The ball gunner uh, couldn't see anything. All the hardware around him, uh, he had to hand charge a shell into his gun with a pulley to speak. So I called positions. If I called a P-38 at 530 low with an engine out, the guy in the ball turret gun couldn't just turn his head. He had to turn the entire ball that way and then go back to neutral. Whenever we were over the target, or in, every 20 minutes, our navigator would call oxygen check. Starting at the tail, we would go around and call in. One day, the radio guy didn't answer. So we went around again, and the waste gunner didn't answer. So the pilot called me and he said, Parker, what's happening back there? Well, I could look past the tail wheel, past the radio, into the radio room, and Faust was out cold. His line had been severed, and Patchigan was trying to get oxygen into him. I reported that to the pilot. He said, we're going down. We dove from 28 to 12,000 feet over Vienna, past the danger line. There's a line that you crossed that could cause it. We saved him. But he was never the same after that. I just thought that, that little story. Oh, by the way, on the way down, he said, prepare to bail out. Well, I was always ready. I, I had my own escape hatch back to that little door, you know, behind the, uh, you don't want me to see <laughs> Well, that's it. I'm, I'm over. Doug, that's up there. The mics are all different. Yeah. So. Okay, so describe your compartment. Um, you know, we see, see a movie or something like that, and it looked like these. They're all sitting in a living room someplace, you know. Talk about the, the tail gunner's compartment. Uh, to get to the, at 10,000 feet, at 10,000 feet, we had to go to our battle stations and get on oxygen. To get to the tail position, I had to take my parachute and throw it ahead of me and go past the uh, tail wheel hardware. And I only weighed 122 pounds, fortunately. Then I would push my purse. Then I would wait for a fighter plane. I would get right to that. Fighters would attack out of the sun. The pursuit curve, they'd come in doubles or fours at 350 miles an hour. Then they would level off and take a shot at the bomber, but they had two problems. One, they knew I was the best tail in the world. Two, it was a swastika I had painted. yards to get a shot and we could shoot them at 600 yards and they lost our forward speed. The bomber was traveling at about 150 miles an hour and they lost that. Now they're only doing 200. So they changed the tactics. They'd come in and they would shoot at the officers and the pilot uh, to get a better shot. Uh, Bob, talk about 
slack a little bit. Now, when you're, you're up in the nose, you're busy, but uh, you can see what's coming. Uh, Vince, Vince saw what had been. oxygen holes and there was a blinker and every time I took a blink I could see that I was getting oxygen and this was so essential it didn't last more than two or three minutes up there so I would wiggle past my ammunition boxes I would go to that little escape hatch back there very small I was looking at the other how I could get through there with a parachute and my body with a but I had my door in the handle and flak was exploding 
and I would substitute fear with fantasy. I would look around the ammunition box at my blinker. It's like a pair of lips. And I pretended that was my girlfriend back at Ortonville kissing me. And when I got home, she was kissing somebody else. Can't believe her. <laughs> this navigator, I don't know how he got here. <laughs> Bob, did you have a uh, friendly fire, fighter cover on all of your missions? Yeah, after my uh, seventh mission, we had the fighter cover that uh, would go both ways with us because they put uh, belly tanks on the P-51s and uh, so they could fly all the way to the target and back. And uh, they dropped those belly tanks either when they were empty or when they got into combat with a German fighter. So that helped a lot. And uh, what to talk about maybe just some different missions because you went into Romania, you went to Hungary, you went to Vienna. Uh, you had a lot of variety in your missions. What, what were the pluses and minuses of some of these various missions? Well, the, the heavier, the heaviest to fit the targets were Budapest, Hungary, uh, Vienna, Austria, and Valesti, Romania, as well as Munich, Germany. Valesti uh, is where they got maybe 50% of their oil, and that was kind of amazing. Uh, we'd go there and we'd have smoke and fire in the air 30,000 feet. We'd go back three days later, later and they're operating at full capacity. They really, the, the Romanians really know how to run those uh, refineries. Those refineries were built in the late 20s by the Dutch and the Americans and then taken over by Hitler in the 1930s. Uh, Budapest, we were usually after a rail yard where they put uh, trains together to deliver products all over Germany. And uh, at Vienna, 12 miles south of Vienna was a, an oil refinery and a, a suburb called Wiener Neustadt. That, that was extremely heavily defended. And uh, the flak there was withered and as, as Parker and I have said you can't do anything about the flak, you just have to go through it. So that, that gives uh, some impression of what, how tough it was. I, I did want to comment on the ground crew. Uh, we brought a whole, uh, we brought an airplane back from Budapest at the end of June 1944. Two engines out, number one and number three engines were out. In two weeks, they had two engines on that airplane and all the holes patched ready to fly again. The guys on the ground were absolutely terrific. Great guys. And uh, I did everything to bribe them. I, I didn't happen to drink beer, so I got six cans, six bottles or cans of beer a week. So I always took them up, got a cold. By the way, I flew in the summertime from June 16th to September 12th. It wasn't so cold then at 25,000 feet. It was only about 30 below. But uh, Parker will tell you how cold it was in the wintertime at 25,000 feet. Okay, but tell them how cold it was in the Well, it was 50 below zero up there. And we had heated suits and heated gloves and our oxygen. So we were kind of toasty unless something happened to all that the stuff that we had to keep us warm. Uh, we took off one day for a target called Hagen's Home in Hungary. We never got there. The ship began to shake like a dog does out of water. I don't know what's happening. I'm in the tail back there. And then suddenly there was a boom, boom. And it stopped shaking. What happened, they couldn't feather an engine. It was, it was shaking. And I was shaking with it. <laughs> Finally, there was a boom boom and it stopped shaking. 
the pilot had told the navigator, find me a place to land, we're not going to get home. What happened? A propeller tore off, sliced through the waist, cut half of my horizontal stable. You know that little wing behind the plane back there? They took one of mine on the left, just sliced it right off. So we landed in a pasture in Yugoslavia. We came to a stop. Nobody was wounded because we hadn't been to the target yet. But the partisans showed up. And a kid, a partisan boy, was on a bicycle. He had a German machine gun on his back. And he grabbed my engineer and he shook him and he said, Cigarette, Joel? Cigarettes were the coin of the realm. He didn't smoke. That, that was just, we called for help. A C-47 flew in, landed. The door flew open. There was a beautiful nurse and a doctor. Ten guys rushing. She's mine. Get in here. We flew back over the Adriatic. We went back to do our tent in our <coughs> waist gunner had not flown. He'd been bumped for a photographer. He'd been crying. And I said later at a reunion, I said, Patchy, you were crying. I, I, you, he said, I knew where your whiskey was behind the clothes rack. We got two shots of whiskey after every mission. That's it. Okay, we're going to take a, a leap in time and technology here. And jump from the B-17s, state of the art in 19... First half of the 1940s, actually almost obsolete by 1945, and jumped to the B-52s. And the B-52s first developed in the mid 50s, early 50s, and now it's 15 years on, mid 60s. Mid 60s. Uh, you can do the question. I asked the oh. question that he got. Okay. Were you ever escorted by the uh, DDR? By who? No, Tuskegee Airmen. Well, the Tuskegee Airmen, did you ever? I was, yeah. The, if you see the uh, movie, The Red Tails, the bomb group that they uh, escort there is the bomb group I was in, the 463rd. Okay, back, back to the 60s. Uh, okay, so jumping from the B-17, B-24, we jump to the B-29, to the B-36, and we make the jump into the jet age of the B-47 and then the B-52, which is still flying today, 74 of them are, are uh, in two different bases and are still flying. Uh, the crew members, whether they be pilots, co-pilots, navigators, bombardiers, gunners, all go to Castle, went to Castle Air Force Base in Southern California, in mid-California. And they went through training to learn how to be on a B-52, how to behave, how to use their uh, uh, particular uh, specialty. From there, they were farmed out to bases as bad as mine on Grand Forks like me, to some bases like Remy Mark down in Puerto Rico, some other luxury bases. Uh, we do know what cold weather is, by the way. Um, I'll talk mainly, mainly about the gunner and the EW, because after all, the pilot just flew the airplane. So this is Vietnam. The B-52s were uh, basically after some testing, loaded with uh, 42 bombs, 750, 750 pounders on uh, pods on the wings, and there was 24,000 pounders in the bomb bay. Uh, that was the wartime configuration, conventional war. Uh, back here in the States, when we were on nuclear alert, there was two big nuclear, excuse me, four big nuclear bombs and two medium-sized bombs out on the wing. But the development was that more to uh, John here. Uh, basically, I was an uh, electronic warfare officer. I went through navigator training, and I had two choices. I could become a uh, navigator, a bomb nav, they call it, bombardier slash navigator, or I could become an electronic warfare officer, or uh, EW, or known as Wizzles, Wizzles Weapon Systems Officer, Recon Officers. My background, uh, 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 my training was all in the area of uh, electronics and uh, 
electronic warfare. One of the reasons I chose electronic warfare was that if I went over to be a bomb nav, I was assured of going to the Strategic Air Command and being bombers. My goal was to be a backseat of uh, any fighter that would take me. Unfortunately, what happened when my graduating class came Strategic Air Command. The reason for that was because the war uh, was winding down for the fire planes. In other words, we weren't bombing up north as much, so they didn't need us type of guys in the back seat. So I arrived up at Grand Forks. I think it was like 25 below in the middle. However, he changed his mind in six months as uh, I went overseas. Okay, before you do that, um, for a lot of us that weren't in the Air Force, what, what's an electronic warfare officer? What do you do? I was just getting to that. Uh, and, and, you know, we have a gunner sitting here. And we, uh, the B-17 B had gunners all over the place. Well, what happened in the interim, receiver where I could check all of the electronic emissions around the area. Then I had specific uh, receivers for fighters and for some other devices. And then I had a barrage of jammers which uh, were transmitters that sent uh, uh, noise into uh, these radars to deprive them. So basically that's what a, a, a EW does. He makes sure that the radars, whether they be wide range radars or specific range, uh, range radars don't get a hold of us, don't find us. And if you think in terms of a binocular, think how hard it is to look at an airplane way up there in a pair of binoculars. Well, it's even harder to uh, direct a surface to air missile or any aircraft gun up there, so you use a radar to direct it. My job was to make sure that radar didn't pick us up. And uh, uh, that was probably the biggest
from altitude. At that point, uh, we lost uh, 16 B 52s in uh, eight days. Uh, we also managed to get uh, a point from all their service to their missiles. And so they had their back to the wall, and that's what resulted in uh, a peace accord. Interestingly, a gentleman was not here today. Chase Lowe's in the morning of the Martini while the B 52s were coming in dropping the bombs. And they actually, he said we could actually see bits and pieces of the bombs from that. Anyway, uh, that's kind of what, where I left, the, uh, I left the service uh, uh, before that. I was over there. because you're constantly flying, you're taking off any, at any time of the day. And uh, contrasting to the B-17s, um, you had a lot of wind going through the planes. You had a lot of wind going through the B-17s. Yeah. And you're wearing all kinds of heavy protective clothing to keep warm. What was the situation in the, in the B-52? We were in the air, it was quite comfortable. On the ground, we sweat. We had oxygen, and in the air we actually did have uh, fairly good heating. Although stateside we always carried uh, uh, winter gear. Uh, it was pretty comfortable inside the airplane. That said, that um, here stateside and out of Guam, the missions were 12 hours. Stateside they ranged all the way up to 18 and 24 hours of flying time. To give you that, the size of the average cockpit, whether you're an EW gunner, uh, NAB, or whatever, was like sitting in a closet. And you were sitting on a ejection seat, which had uh, roughly about four inches of soft foam rubber, which compressed to nothing. Uh, again, unlike the B-17s, they could look out the window, they could see things that were in front of them. Now, you as the electronic warfare officer probably saw things on your screen. But generally within the aircraft, if somebody's shooting SAMs at you, what does the, what does the crew know about it? Uh, they better listen to me. <laughs> so, I mean, you're their eyes. You're the eyes and ears. There's a special uh, receiver that I had that set right up here. And it would send blips. And uh, when you saw a little signal down here on the scope and you saw that thing going crazy, at that point, all you could do was uh, S turns and then uh, pray or whatever. Because uh, uh, they were pretty darn accurate. 
And the B-17s, we think of mass formations, 1,000 plane raids, but lots and lots of planes in the air. And when you go on a mission, what was the situation? Did you go in line? Did you go on a B formation? How many planes would typically be on a mission? On a typical mission, there was four, uh, excuse me, two cells made up of three B-52s. And they would drop uh, in units of three. In other words, the first plane would drop, the first three would drop in one area, the other three would drop in another area, and they were directed by ground radar 99% uh, of the time. Out of Guam, there was four uh, uh, cells a day going out. Out of Utapau, there was eight, and out of, uh, excuse me, out of Okinawa, there was eight, and out of uh, Utapau, That means groups of three airplanes. And, and, and uh, on each plane you carried conventional conventional bombs, about how many thousand pounds? I can't do the adding. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, 24 uh, 750s and, excuse me, 24,000 pounders and 42 and 750s. What's that number? 64,000. Thank you. 64,000 pounds. And how many pounds did you carry on the B-17? 6,000. 6,000. So, so a lot more punch for a few aircraft. But the other thing I'd like to add is the reason why we didn't carry more was the airplane was also pretty much constructed of gas tanks. And I will touch on the co-pilot. His job was to make sure that those gas tanks had, had even the amount of fuel on either side of the airplane and forward and aft. Because if that got goofed up, uh, the plane would not fly very well. So his job up there was making sure he was switching all the fuel to transfer all the fuel to the engine. That was his main duty, and a very important duty. And now, at, you're flying at the end of the war. You've been in the service for a long time. You've heard all the stories about POWs in, in Hanoi for seven years. And you're seeing lots of planes go down. And was that something that weighed heavily on the minds of the crews? Actually, that did not weigh heavily on the B-50 crews that I was with. Uh, and one of the reasons why is the safety record. Uh, what I mean by that is we're more likely, much, much more likely to have uh, operator error put us down or mechanical error than any uh, combat. Uh, because the, uh, uh, every B-52 crew member was nuclear qualified. Uh, the Air Force took very good care of us. The last thing in the world they wanted is for any of us new guys to be captured and interrogated. And uh, the, the B-52, I, I had not had an opportunity to talk to any of the B-52 people that were uh, captured during this uh, uh, Christmas bombings, but uh, I think at that point Hanoi had other problems and uh, spent a lot of time interrogating them. John, you came in, uh, you're a cold warrior, I guess. Well, you all were. <laughs> but, <laughs> all were. Well, not for a long time. But uh, specifically, um, you came in in the 80s, and can you talk a little bit about changes, upgrades in the B-52? I mean, it's an incredible aircraft flying from the early 50s to today. It's, uh, and, and how it's constantly going through modification. So from between 72 and, and the 80s when you were flying, how did it change? Okay, I, first, I'd like to actually go back a little farther even uh, to the B-17 and contrast uh, Bob, Bob's role as a navigator to mine. Uh, Bob came in at the infancy of high altitude navigation and Vince as well with high altitude operations. Uh, we didn't know much about high altitude operations uh, with flying aircraft before World War II. That was the first time we really started dealing with the conditions at high altitude. Uh, they kind of briefly mentioned, oh, it wasn't so bad up there. We had these suits, we were nice and toasty warm. It's only 30 below outside. Uh, they're rattling around in this airplane with an unpressurized cockpit. Okay, now to put this in perspective, you've got Bob down there, his responsibility is to get this aircraft formation to 
same target. If he doesn't find that target, someone else has to come back. Okay, and, and, and if he gets off course and drives that formation over a high concentration of black, people die. People come, have to come back the next day, people die. So then put yourself, take the coldest day next winter, Okay, just gear up, you know, put on whatever you want, sit outside for about six or eight hours. Put, put on whatever you want, no Gore-Tex. Make, yes. no, no yeah, yeah. yeah. Make sure that it's heavy and real bulky. Right. Yeah. Uh, sit on your table on a stool, you know, don't take the comfortable chair. Uh, start doing math calculations and plotting vectors on pieces of paper for about six to eight hours. And then check your math and your calculations, make sure you don't make any mistakes. All the while breathing through a little tube, okay. These guys are breathing oxygen at high altitude. You, it's, um, do you have any scuba divers here? Okay. It's reverse breathing. When you're at high altitude, the, the lack of air pressure, the oxygen system is kind of reverse. You have to blow air out, then you relax your lungs and it pushes air in. Then you blow air out and you have to learn how to do that. Try thinking about breathing once. How, how fast do you breathe? You know, most people, when they start thinking about breathing, hyperventilate. The good thing about hyperventilating is you pass out, and then you start breathing normal, and then you come to. But um, these guys are operating in that condition. I'm operating in a condition where, as, uh, sorry, <laughs> Glenn says, pressurized cabin, nice and comfortable. We don't have to wear a jacket. I have a nice table like this in front of me. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but I've been up navigating this airplane. And I'm using also navigation techniques that were just developed for high altitude. At the time of World War II, the Navy was doing navigation and celestial navigation for hundreds of years. But now we take their techniques and now we put them up 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet into the air. And we have all the, all, there's different effects that come into play. We're trying to use a sextant in an airplane that's bouncing around if you're doing cell nav. And uh, I'm one of the navigators that was on an aircraft in the transition period. When I started navigating, we learned celestial nav. Uh, so we had to navigate by stars and we navigated by pressure. Uh, we had a drift meter called a Doppler. I think it was a little more advanced than the state-of-the-art technology that Bob was using. But uh, however reliable that was, we had everything we had was just exponentially better equipment at running it. It's a basic DR. The idea is exactly the same. The concepts are the same. They developed them, and I'm using them. And, uh, but it's just things are perfected a little better, and we have better equipment. And so I started out with this celestial navigation. We didn't have INSs on the B-52 when I started. GPS didn't even exist. If you said GPS, people would look at you kind of cross-eyed. Okay, during my, during my time, uh, the B-52 was upgraded with dual INS. Uh, it was this, basically the same navigation system that the space shuttle has, they had. And uh, we had that put into the aircraft. I was in, in the last unit to receive trained on the new navigation system. I don't know if that was a good thing or if they trusted the, you know, us or what, what that was all about, but uh, we got trans transitioned over to the INS systems and then they started reducing celestial, the need for celestial navigation and that requirement started going away. Then that same, this is at the second bomb wing down at Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana. It was primarily a conventional role that we were switching to. So, uh, primary B-52, uh, our main support was in support of the SIA Single Integrated Option Plan, which is the nuclear deterrent strategy. Uh, that was our primary mission, holding alert. And uh, when we did that mission, our standard typical loadout, uh, we had four gravity nuclear bombs in the forward bomb bay. We had eight short-range attack missiles, in the aft bomb bay, and we had 12 air launch cruise missiles out on the wings. So that was a pretty significant nuclear force in one, in one bomber. We're talking 24 weapons. Um, I heard Spook talk last year, 
last uh, last night. He was an A1 Sky Raider pilot, and he was uh, flying off the Van Marshar. And he was talking about their support of the Saya. Uh, the Van Marshar had a total of 48 nuclear weapons on board. He stated, "Okay, we have half of that on one bomb. Okay, uh, the typical mission that we would train for, we would launch out of our." Air Force Base, and then we would climb up to altitude, hook up with a tanker, do a training, primarily a training refueling. Uh, part of the training, the pilot had to be connected for 20 minutes. That would simulate down offloading a fuel load that we would typically have if we were in support of the PSYOP. Uh, we would typically transfer about 2,000 pounds. Hey John, just uh, to interrupt you here for a second, the whole concept of Kind of amazing. Uh, yes. And you know, these two huge aircraft full of fuel, and you're transferring fuel from one to the other. Right. Can you just talk a little more in detail about that? Because uh, the concept uh, referred to with aerial, aerial refueling, it's a controlled mid air collision <laughs> between two aircraft. And what we're doing, uh, we set up, we get the tankers, and those guys were great. They, they were spot on all the time, never had a problem with that. Um, we told them, basically planned out when, where, and how much. Okay, so we give them an altitude and an air refueling track that we're going to be on. We tell them how much we're going to uh, want them to offload, and we tell them what time we're going to be there. Then the tanker sets up an orbit. Then we come in on the track, and it's very much, very much like a bomb run that this is run. There's, there's it's a, an IP, an initial point where you start refueling, and the tanker uh, is orbiting in front of that. We follow along the track, we pick up the tanker off our nose, and they're usually at this point coming toward us. Then they, they'll go, because they're flying what we call a, just a racetrack. It's a nice long oval, and now we're coming in, And then we just accelerate. We're coming in below, and we're both going the same direction. And then the B-52 just comes up real nice and easy and parks itself right underneath the tank. Okay, so the boom, excuse me, the boom comes, he's talking about how nice it is. Well, I'm sitting underneath that boom, and it just go boom when it drops. I gotta walk out, walk around, take out my flashlight, and look around and go like some L and JP4. Only when I when that's done can I say pass, pass gas, <laughs> and the gas rolls into the plane. Yeah, and, uh, got, got about a minute left. Okay, now this is our yeah Glenn. Glenn, he's he's expendable on these training missions, <laughs> so we can we're all sleep our injection seats. But, uh, but yeah, so we hook up to this tanker, uh, do our air refueling, then we, the mission changed, now we're going to do low level. B-52 was designed as a high level bomber, but uh, the Soviet Union started developing missiles, they're shooting airplanes like uh, U-2s down, uh, the, now the penetration roll has gone to low level, we're flying a B-52 at two to 500 feet off the ground, and uh, we're using high drag munitions. Uh, both Nuclear, if we're not, if we're not, we shoot all our missiles off before we even start penetrating our externals. We have the internal short-range attack missiles that we can shoot, launch those within a couple hundred feet of the ground. And they'll go out and reach out the targets. The gravity bombs have parachutes on them too. They do a lay-down delivery so we don't blow ourselves up when we drop them. Uh, so they come down in the chute, and if you stop by uh, the Strategic Air Command booth, I have a picture of a test drop I did back in 1988 of one of those nuclear bombs with the laydown. And uh, right before I got out, we went to uh, start integrating the global positioning satellite. Uh, that system was uh, was a little dicey initially. The space shuttle is the primary launch vehicle that was putting up all the uh, satellites. Challenger disaster happened. There was a delay in the satellites going up. We were integrating GPS units on the B-52. 
and we didn't have enough satellites. We called it the amoeba. There was this amoeba of satellites going around the world. And any given day, you'd take off and you'd maybe get one or two, we call them stars, uh, that we could get, and that would basically give us an altitude. Uh, on a good day, we'd get five or six of them, and that'd give us a real tight decision. But that's, that's that transition now. Celestial Map isn't even being taught in navigator school. Uh, the navigators are become more of a weapons system officer and more of a monitor. Uh, we have multiple INSs, multiple GPS on these aircraft. Okay, just uh, final comment. Uh, I know we got an Americal guy here from Vietnam. Any other brown people from Vietnam? Ever see an arc light? Okay. There's one. Pretty awesome, I think. Right? Uh, talk to these guys later if you'd like. Please uh, see them over in the tent. There's lots more stories. And uh, next, we've got uh, crowd pleasers. Thank you.